the Pharisee and the Publican. And he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The scope of this parable likewise is prefixed to it, and we are told who they were whom it was leveled at, and for whom it was calculated. He designed it for the conviction of some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and despised others. They were such as had a great conceit of themselves and of their own goodness. They thought themselves as holy as they needed to be, and holier than all their neighbours, and such as might serve for examples to them all. But that was not all. They had a confidence in themselves before God, and not only had a high opinion of their own righteousness, but depended upon the merit of it whenever they addressed God as their plea. They trusted in themselves as being righteous. They thought that they had made God their debtor and might demand anything from him, and they despised others and looked upon them with contempt as not worthy to be compared with them. Now Christ by this parable would show, would show such their folly, and that thereby they shut themselves out from acceptance with God. This is called a parable, though there be nothing of similitude in it, but it is rather a description of the different temper and language of those that proudly justify themselves, and those that humbly condemn themselves, and their different standing before God. It is matter of fact every day. Here are both these addressing themselves to the duty of prayer at the same place and time. Two men went up into the temple, for the temple stood upon a hill, to pray. It was not the hour of public prayer, but they went thither to offer up their personal devotions, as was usual with good people at that time. when the temple was not only the place but the medium of worship, and God had promised, in answer to Solomon's request, that whatever prayer was made in a right manner in or towards that house, it should therefore the rather be accepted. Christ is our temple, and to him we must have an eye in all our approaches to God. The Pharisees and the publican both went to the temple to pray. Note, among the worshippers of God in the visible church there is a mixture of good and bad, of some that are accepted of God and some that are not, and so it has been ever since Cain and Abel brought their offering to the same altar. The Pharisee, proud as he was, could not think himself above prayer, nor could the publican, humble as he was, think himself shut out from the benefit of it, but we have reason to think that these went with different views. The Pharisee went to the temple to pray because it was a public place, more public than the corners of the streets, and therefore he should have many eyes upon him, who would applaud his devotion, which perhaps was more than was expected. The character Christ gave of the Pharisees, that all their works they did to be seen of men, gives us occasion for this suspicion. Note, hypocrites keep up the external performances of religion only to save or gain credit. There are many whom we see every day at the temple, whom it is to be feared we shall not see in the great day at Christ's right hand. The publican went to the temple because it was appointed to be a house of prayer for all people. The Pharisee came to the temple upon a compliment, the publican upon business, the Pharisee to make his appearance, the publican to make his request. Now God sees with what disposition and design we come to wait upon him in holy ordinances, and will judge of us accordingly. Here is the Pharisee's address to God, for a prayer I cannot call it. He stood and prayed thus with himself. Standing by himself, he prayed thus, so some read it, he was wholly intent upon himself, had nothing in his eye but self, his own praise and not God's glory, or standing in some conspicuous place where he distinguished himself, or setting himself with a great deal of state and formality, he prayed thus. Now that which he is here supposed to say is that which shows. 
that he trusted to himself that he was righteous. A great many good things he said of himself which we will suppose to be true. He was free from gross and scandalous sins. He was not an extortioner, not a usurer, not oppressive to debtors or tenants, but fair and kind to all that had dependence on him. He was not unjust in any of his dealings. He did no man any wrong. He could say, as Samuel, whose ox or whose ass have I taken? He was no adulterer, but had possessed his vessel in sanctification and honor. Yet this was not all. He fasted twice in the week, as an act partly of temperature, partly of devotion. The Pharisees and their disciples fasted twice a week, Monday and Thursday. Thus he glorified God with his body. Yet that was not all. He gave tithes of all that he possessed, according to the law, and so glorified God with his worldly estate. Now all this was very well and commendable. Miserable is the condition of those who come short of the righteousness of this Pharisee. Yet he was not accepted. And why was he not? His giving God thanks for this, though in itself a good thing, yet seems to be a mere formality. He does not say, by the grace of God I am what I am, as Paul did, but turns it off with a slight. God, I thank thee, which is intended but for a plausible introduction to a proud, vainglorious ostentation of himself. He makes his boast of this and dwells with delight upon this subject, as if all his business to the temple was to tell God Almighty how very good he was, and he is ready to say with those hypocrites that we read, Wherefore have we fasted and thou seest not? He trusted to it as a righteousness, and not only mentioned it, but pleaded it. As if hereby he had merited at the hands of God and made him his debtor. Here is not one word of prayer in all he saith. He went up to the temple to pray, but forgot his errand, was so full of himself and his own goodness that he thought he had need of nothing, no, not of the favour and grace of God, which, it would seem, he did not think worth asking. He thought meanly of all mankind but himself. I thank thee that I am not as other men are. He speaks indefinitely, as if he were better than any. We may have reason to thank God that we are not as some men are, that are notoriously wicked and vile, but to speak at random thus, as if we only were good, and all besides us were reprobates, is to judge by wholesale. He thought meanly in a particular manner of this publican, whom he had left behind, it is probable, in the court of the Gentiles, and whose company had, he had fallen into as he came to the temple. He knew that he was a publican, and therefore very uncharitably concluded that he was an extortioner, unjust and all that is naught. Suppose it had been so, and he had known it. What business had he to take notice of it? Could not he say his prayers, and that was all that Pharisees did, without reproaching his neighbours? Or was this a part of his God, I thank thee? And was he as much pleased with the publican's badness as with his own goodness? There could not be a plainer evidence, not only of the want of humility and charity, but of reigning pride and malice than this was. Here is the publican's address to God, which was the reverse of the Pharisees, as full of humility and humiliation as his was of pride and ostentation, as full of repentance for sin and desire towards God as his was of confidence in himself and his own righteousness and sufficiency. He expressed his repentance and humility in what he did, and his gesture, when he addressed himself to his devotions, was expressive of great seriousness and humility, and the proper clothing of a broken, penitent, and obedient heart. He stood afar off. The Pharisee stood, but crowded up as high as he could, to the upper end of the court. The publican kept at a distance under a sense of his unworthiness to draw near to God, and perhaps for fear of offending the Pharisee, whom he observed to look scornfully upon him and of disturbing his devotions. Hereby he owned that God might justly behold him afar off and send him into a state of eternal distance from him, and that it was a great favour that God was pleased to admit him thus nigh. He would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, much less his hands, as was usual in prayer. He did lift up his heart to God in the heavens in holy desires, but through prevailing shame and humiliation he did not lift up his eyes in holy confidence and courage. His iniquities are gone over his head as a heavy burden, so that he is not able to look up. The dejection of his looks is an indication of the dejection of his mind at the thought of sin. He smote upon his breast in a holy indignation at himself for sin. This would I smite this wicked heart of mine, the poison fountain out of which flow all the streams of sin, if I could come at it. 
The sinner's heart first smites him in the penitent rebuke. David's heart smote him. Sinner, what hast thou done? And then he smites his heart with penitent remorse. O wretched man that I am! Ephraim is said to smite upon his thigh. Great mourners are represented, tabering upon their breasts. He expressed it in what he said. His prayer was short. Fear and shame hindered him from saying much. Sighs and groans swallowed up his words. But what he said was to the purpose, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And blessed be God that we have this prayer upon record as an answered prayer, and that we are sure that he who prayed it went to his house justified, and so shall we if we pray it as he did through Jesus Christ. God be merciful to me, a sinner. The God of infinite mercy be merciful to me, for if he be not, I am forever undone, forever miserable. God be merciful to me, for I have been cruel to myself. He who owns himself a sinner by nature, by practice, guilty before God. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? The Pharisee denies himself to be a sinner. None of his neighbors can charge him, and he sees no reason to charge himself with anything amiss. He is clean, he is pure from sin. But the publican gives himself no other character than that of a sinner, a convicted criminal at God's bar. He has no dependence but upon the mercy of God, that and that only he relies upon. The Pharisee had insisted upon the merit of his fasting and tithes, but the poor publican disclaims all thought of merit and flies to mercy as his city of refuge and takes hold of the horn of that altar. Justice condemns me, nothing will save me but mercy, mercy. He earnestly prays for the benefit of that mercy. O God, be merciful, be propitious to me, forgive my sins, be reconciled to me, take me into thy favor, receive me graciously, love me freely. He comes as a beggar for an alms when he is ready to perish for hunger. Probably he repeated this prayer with renewed affections, and perhaps said more to the same purport, made a particular confession of his sins, and mentioned the particular mercies he wanted, and waited upon God for, but still this was the burden of the song, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Here is the publican's acceptance with God. We have seen how differently these two address themselves to God. It is now worthwhile to inquire how they sped. There were those who would cry up the Pharisee, by whom he would go to his house applauded, and who would look with contempt upon his, this sneaking, whining publican. But our Lord Jesus, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secret is hid, who is perfectly acquainted with all proceedings in the court of heaven, assures us that this poor, penitent, broken-hearted publican went to his house justified, rather than the other. The Pharisee thought that if one of them must be justified and not the other, certainly it must be he rather than the publican. No, saith Christ, I tell you, I affirm it with the utmost assurance and declare it to you with the utmost concern. I tell you, it is the publican rather than the Pharisee. The proud Pharisee goes away, rejected of God. His thanksgivings are so far from being accepted that they are an abomination. He is not justified, his sins are not pardoned, nor is he delivered from condemnation. He is not accepted as righteous in God's sight, because he is so righteous in his own sight. But the publican, upon this humble address to heaven, obtains the remission of his sins, and he whom the Pharisee would not set with the dogs of his flock, God sets with the children of his family. The reason given for this is because God's glory is to resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Proud men who exalt themselves are rivals with God, and therefore they shall certainly be abased. God, in his discourse with Job, appeals to this proof that he is God, that he looks upon every one that is proud and brings him low. Humble men who abase themselves are subject to God, and they shall be exalted. God has preferment in store for those that will take it as a favor, not for those that demand it as a debt. He shall be exalted into the love of God and communion with him, shall be exalted into a satisfaction in himself and exalted at last as high as heaven. See how the punishment answers the sin. He that exalted himself shall be abased. 
See how the recompense answers the duty. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. See also the power of God's grace in bringing good out of evil. The publican had been a great sinner, and out of the greatness of his sin was brought the greatness of his repentance. Out of the eater came forth meat. See, on the contrary, the power of Satan's malice in bringing evil out of good. It was good that the Pharisee was no extortioner, nor unjust, but the devil made him proud of this to his ruin. You who love instruction and are eager to listen, receive once again the sacred words. Delight yourselves in the honey of wisdom, for so it is written, Good works are honeycombs, and their sweetness is the healing of the soul. For the labor of the bees is very sweet, and benefits in many ways the soul of man. But the divine and saving honey makes those in whom it dwells skillful in every good work, and teaches them the ways of spiritual improvement. Let us therefore, as I said, receive again in mind and heart the Saviour's words, for he teaches us in what manner we ought to make our requests unto him, in order that the act may not prove unrewarded to them who practice it, and that no one may anger God, the bestower of gifts from on high, by means of those very things by which he imagines that he shall gain some benefit. For it is written, There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. For see... I pray an instance of this clearly painted, so to speak, in the parable set before us. One who prayed is condemned because he did not offer his prayer wisely. For two men, it says, went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And here we must admire the wise arrangement of Christ our common Saviour in all things whatsoever he does and says. For by the parable previously read to us, he called us to diligence and to the duty of offering prayer constantly. For the evangelist said, and he spoke unto them also a parable, to the intent that men ought always to pray and must not grow weary. Having then urged them to diligence in constant prayer, yet, as I said, lest by doing so sedulously but without discretion, we should enrage him whom we supplicate. We, he very excellently shows us in what way we ought to be diligent in prayer. Two men then, he says, went up unto the temple to pray. Observe here, I pray, the impartiality and entire fairness of the unerring nature. For he calls those who are praying men, since he looks not so much at wealth or power, but regarding their natural equality, he considers all those who dwell upon earth as men, and as in no respect different from one another. And what then was the manner of their prayer? The Pharisee, it says, prayed thus to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of mankind, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or as this publican. Many at once are the faults of the, par of the Pharisee, for first of all he is boastful, and without sense, for he praises himself, although the sacred scripture cries aloud, Let a neighbor praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. But, O oh, excellent sir, one may well say to him, Behold, those who live in the practice of good and holy actions, as any one may see, are not very ready to listen to the words of flatterers. Yes, and even if men extol them, they often are covered with shame, and drop their eyes to the ground, and beg silence of those that praise them. But this shameless Pharisee praises and extols himself, because he is better than extortioners, and the unjust and adulterers. But how did it escape your notice that a man's being better than the bad does not necessarily, and of course prove him, to be worthy of admiration, but that to vie with those who habitually excel is a noble and honourable thing, and admits a man into the number of those who are justly praised? Our virtue, therefore, must not be contaminated with fault, but must be single-minded and blameless, and free from all that can bring a rep reproach. For what profit is there in fasting twice in the week, if your so doing serve only as a pretext for ignorance and vanity, and make you supercilious and haughty and selfish? You tithe your possessions and make a boast thereof, but you in another way provoke God's anger by condemning men generally on this account and accusing others, and you are yourself puffed up, though not crowned by the divine decree of righteousness, but heap, on the contrary, praises upon yourself. For I am not, he says, as the rest of mankind. Moderate yourself, O Pharisee, put a door to your tongue and a lock. You speak to God who knows all things. 
await the decree of the judge. None of those skilled in the practice of wrestling ever crowns himself, nor does any man receive the crown of himself, but awaits the summons of the arbiter. Lower your pride, for arrogance is both accursed and hated by God. Although therefore you fast with puffed up mind, your so doing will not avail you. Your labor will be unrewarded, for you have mingled dung with your perfume. Even according to the law of Moses, a sacrifice that had a blemish was not capable of being offered to God. For it was said unto him, Of sheep and ox that is offered for sacrifice, there must be no blemish therein. Since therefore your fasting is accompanied by pride, you must expect to hear God saying, This is not the fast that I have chosen, says the Lord. You offer tithes, but you wrong in another way him who is honoured by you, in that you condemn men generally. This is an act foreign to the mind that fears God. For Christ even said, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. And one also of his disciples said, There is one lawgiver and judge. Why then do you judge your neighbour? No man, because he is in health, ridicules one who is sick for being laid up and bedridden. Rather, he is afraid, lest perchance he become himself the victim of similar sufferings. Nor does any man in battle, because another has fallen, praise himself for having escaped from misfortune. For the infirmity of others is not a fit subject for praise for those who are in health. Nay, even if anyone be found of more than usually vigorous health, even then scarcely does he gain glory thereby. Such then was the state of the self-loving Pharisee. But what of the publican? He stood, it says, afar off, not even venturing, so to speak, to raise up his eyes on high. You see him abstaining from all boldness of speech, as having no right thereto, and smitten by the reproaches of conscience, for he was afraid of being even seen by God, as one who had been careless of his laws, and had led an unchaste and dissolute life. You see also that by his external manner he accuses his own depravity. For the foolish Pharisee stood there bold and broad, lifting up his eyes without scruple, bearing witness of himself and boastful. But the other feels shame at his conduct. He is afraid of his judge. He smites upon his breast. He confesses his offenses. He shows his malady as to the physician. He prays that he may have mercy. And what is the result? Let us hear what the judge says. This man, he says, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Let us therefore pray without ceasing, according to the expression of the blessed Paul. But let us be careful to do so aright. The love of self is displeasing to God, and he rejects empty haughtiness and a proud look, puffed up often and on account of that which is by no means excellent. And even if a man be good and sober, let him not on this account suffer himself to fall away into shameful pride. But rather let him remember Christ, who says to the holy apostles, When you have done all those things, those namely which have been commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. For we owe unto God over all, as from the yoke of necessity, the service of slaves, and ready obedience in all things. Yes, though you lead an excellent and elect life, don't exact wages from the Lord, but rather ask of him a gift. As being good, he will promise it to you. As a loving father, he will aid you. Restrain not yourself then from saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Remember him who says by the voice of Isaiah, Declare you your sins first, that you may be justified. Remember too that he rebukes those who will not do so, and says, Behold, I have a judgment against you, because you say I have not sinned. Examine the words of the saints, for one says, The righteous is the accuser of himself in the beginning of his words. And another again, I said, I will confess against myself my transgression unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my heart. What answer then will those make to this who embrace the new tenets of Novatus, and say of themselves that they are pure? Whose prayer do they praise? That of the Pharisee who equated himself, or that of the publican who accused himself? If they say that of the Pharisee they resist the divine sentence, for he was condemned as being boastful, but if that of the publican, why do they refuse to acknowledge their own impurity? Certainly God justifies those who know well their transgressions and are willing to confess them, but these men will have the portion of the Pharisee. 
We then say that in many things we all of us offend, and that no man is pure from uncleanness, even though his life upon earth be but one day. Let us ask then of God mercy, which if we do, Christ will justify us, by whom and with whom to God the Father be praise and dominion with the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen.